Welcome back. It's the World Soccer Talk podcast, the only podcast that focuses on watching soccer on TV, online and apps. In episode 120, we discuss an incredible week in the Champions League. NBC ramps up its Premier League coverage. What's wrong with soccer fans in New York City? Plus letters from you, the listeners, in our mailbag section. My name is Christopher Harris, a.k.a. The Gaffer, and I'm joined by my co-host, as always, Kartik Krishnayer. Kartik, how are things? Here, you're going well, Chris. How about you for you? Good, really good. I, this past weekend, uh, I had uh, the privilege of making a journey that you've probably made uh, probably at least 50 times, and that is to go see uh, a home game for Tampa Bay Rowdies. So uh, this past weekend for the Saturday nights, I went to Alang Stadium right there in St. Petersburg, right on the bay to watch uh, the Rowdies against um, Louisville. And uh, I wrote about it. Actually, it's on worldsoccertalk.com as far as the, uh, the report about it. But I really enjoyed it. And it was really a fantastic club in terms of just the way that everything's set up. I was really impressed with uh, how well everything is run. Yeah, it's, it's a venue I'm familiar with. Spent, uh, I don't know if it's quite the number is 50. I've, I've done at least 20 games there at Al Lang. And uh, it's right on the bay. It's a great vista. Um, the configuration, while a little clunky for soccer because it is a converted baseball stadium, is about as good as it gets in terms of a non-soccer specific stadium. And um, the Rowdy staff is top class and they have been for years. And um, the Rowdies were always a, uh, a team, even when I worked with them with NASL, they had, they had fewer staff but better staff. So. This is a lesson if you're in the soccer business, you don't have to hire 40 people to get the job done if you hire 10 very competent people, which uh, the former owner, Andrew Nestor, did, and and and, the, and then Bill Edwards, who owned the team after, uh, kept that, beefed it up a bit, and now it's owned by the Tampa Bay Rays. So glad you enjoyed that experience. It's, it's a great club and a great, uh, great, great little venue. And we did a um, mini documentary on it at yep. Soccer Talk many years ago about that uh, venue and uh, – uh, a 4th of July game against Fort Lauderdale that they played. Yep, yep, that's still on YouTube. And uh, for fans of soccer, you, you don't have to be a Tampa Bay Rowdies fan, but, f- but for fans of soccer, uh, definitely check it out because it is a club that uh, it really has a, a close-knit connection to the community, and, and it's great to see. It's, and it's been around since 1975, uh, the club, so with a proud history. Speaking of proud history, Kartik, uh, the Champions League. I mean, we have to talk about this from the top. Uh, what a crazy week of football it's been. Uh, for me personally, I mean, obviously I, I enjoyed the games. Um, but for me personally, the, the actual commentary was fantastic. That, that's one of the things I, I enjoyed particularly uh, from this past week. So looking at the Man City Spurs game, uh, Guy, Guy Mowbray and Danny Higginbotham, uh, both of which I thought did a fantastic job. Danny Higginbotham especially, though, because I think in, in many ways, analyzing what happened with Lorente's uh, goal, and he was looking at it and, and on, on the replay, uh, picking out the muscle movement in the arm to indicate that the, must, yeah. the ball must have touched his, his arm. And uh, it wasn't until after the decision had been made to allow the goal that we saw a different replay of this incident from behind the goal. And this was something that if the VAR officials had seen that uh, additional camera angle behind the goal, I think they would have, would have disallowed the goal, and, um, which was a huge, huge call. And obviously, too, with uh, Aguero being offside, but that was legit. He was, he was definitely offside by the, 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 the thinnest of margins. But what VAR has done, Kartik, I think, is really... I mean, there's people that hate it. We've gotten some tweets from people that are saying that VAR has killed the game. Uh, it does make it fairer. It doesn't make it perfect, but it does add a whole lot of drama. I mean, this game was back and forth anyway. The VAR added on top made it this one just uh, probably one of the most memorable, ge- memorable games in years. H- how about you? Well, you could argue the opposite because Llorente goes and celebrates the goal what if they, in front of Spurs supporters. Such a big moment for them. Um, what if they had chopped that goal off? Uh, same thing. You could say it gives more just results, but football is not necessarily about justice. We know that. There are all kinds of unjust results going back in this competition to Leeds final against Bayern Munich in 1975, etc. Uh, same thing with Manchester City after they scored their goal, the wild celebration. Uh, then it's chopped off. That was legitimate. 
Now, um, that was legitimately offside, Aguero. I uh, had a couple of different shots that, that show that. On the Llorente goal, I'm very much in the air about it, which means you let the original call stand, which is it was a goal. Um, here's the thought process on that. Shaka Hislop explained it yesterday on ESPN FC that basically um, – if it's a defender, if your right is a defender, there's no problem at all. He didn't, you know, the hand hand is down. He gets the slightest of touches before it goes off the shoulder uh, from that other angle, the other angle you mentioned that the bar official didn't see, and um, the uh, that Higginbotham and Mowbray didn't see until after um, all of this all was said and done. Now, in scoring a goal, the law is different. You're you cannot be aided by. Uh, the arm, it's not necessarily a red card offense or a penalty. So the interpretation of the law might be different on a, uh, on an actual goal that's scored versus um, uh, a defender doing the same thing. Uh, that was interesting. I had I, I had not actually thought about that uh, because if it is a defender, I think you let the goal stand, right? Uh, or, you know, you don't call a handball is what I mean. If, if that's a defender that did that, that it went off the arm kind of barely. But great point by Danny Higginbotham about the uh, the muscle reflexes. That that's the only way you would know, right? Really. Yeah, f- from that angle that they saw, um, and, and that's the thing though too. I mean, uh, to me, I mean, the handball is such a gray area in general. Anyway, this is probably the biggest weak- weakness about soccer overall. Is is that is that uh, the handball? Whether I mean, you see it in any game you watch, as far as whether it's youth soccer, professional soccer, you name it. You mean parents screaming out, or you mean fans screaming out? Handball, handball! Yes, the ball did hit hit the hands, but you mean some referees would call it, some referees won't wouldn't call it. And I believe for next season too, for the Champions League, uh, the, the the actual uh, rule is going to be different too. Where something like that, if that did happen, I believe it would be chalked off. Um, but it, it is still one of those kind of areas that's difficult sometimes to for for a newcomer to the sport to explain exactly exactly you mean everything from intent to no intent in terms of kind of a um the motion of the hand whether it was kind of a you mean it was even deliberate or just you mean someone hits a ball at you and hits the hand yeah it's 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 a shame really too because it's it should be to me it should be black and white it should be okay either the ball hits the hand all right, that's that's a handball, no matter what, or it isn't. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, in terms of but it's the, the arm also, and uh, and the arm too. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we call it a handball, but it's in fact more than that. It's any part of that a limb that connects to the hand, and and we've seen shoulders count as handballs, which it shouldn't, but mm-hmm. that we've seen misinterpretations of the law. So yeah, it's a wildly inconsistent thing, I guess, in how it's interpreted from match to match, and it is a frustrating thing for soccer fans. And um, this also shows with VAR, if you want to get on with the match quickly, um, which the official, this is a top official, um, you want to get on with the match quickly, you can't really keep looking at the uh, at the replay. Now, I've seen in, 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 in American sports where um, uh, it, it, I, they just keep looking and looking and looking, and, and, and the, the match... The, the life of it is sucked out. Well, that well, that's the thing about this one call, though, too, is that uh, maybe they went too quickly on this one because the actual the replay from behind the goal came on te- on TV sets maybe like what a minute or two after uh, after the goal had been awarded, and maybe they rushed into that one a little bit too fast. Well, um, I guess for for the American fan that wants to you know stop the game and start it, that's fine. But I, I you can never be too fast in my yeah. opinion. I mean, I'm still very uncomfortable with this concept. So um, obviously this goal stood. The other one did. And the other one is an offside call. That's straightforward. Yep. That takes a second. It was offside. Uh, right. Aguero. But this, I don't even really like looking at this for more than uh, 30 seconds. Okay, maybe uh, maybe it shouldn't have been a goal. I don't know. But the call was for a goal. And I don't like the idea of sitting for five minutes and saying, ah, now we have a replay from behind the goal. And Llorente handled it. shouldn't be a goal. I, I don't like the idea of that. Yeah, I I don't like that either in terms of just kind of the I mean cuz oftentimes things in in the real time things move so quickly I mean sometimes it it can you, you can't prove if that was deliberate or or not um you know I mean and and just like focusing zeroing in laser focused on every little you mean touch of the ball or every little angle of the ball and and it it can get become very um you mean too much really 
But, but, but in terms of the commentary, I really thought that Guy Mowbray and Danny Higginbotham did a good job in that one. The other game, too, this past week, too, that I was really, um, well, Champions League-wise, uh, uh, really enjoyed the commentary was uh, the Juventus-Ajax game. And then on the World Feed, we got uh, Jonathan Pierce and Gary Bertels. Gary is always... Uh, I think a lot of people either love him or hate him. He's always one of those uh, co-commentators that no matter what happens, he's always uh, has has the advantage of hindsight and says, "Okay, well, that player should have at least you mean shot on goal, or why didn't he do this, or why didn't he do that?" So sometimes that can be a bit annoying. But Jonathan Pierce is someone that ha- always has so much energy, so much passion in his voice, has a, a really unique uh, accent. And somebody that really always lifts up the game and works a lot too. You'll you'll hear him on Europa League. You'll hear him on uh, obviously Champions League, but lots of other games too. And I really enjoyed that commentary there. I, the the BT Sport feed was Peter Drury, I believe, and I, I heard that one was also uh, really good. Some some, some clips on uh, Twitter about that one. Kartik, any any thoughts on uh, TNT's coverage this week um, in terms of uh, for the Champions League uh, pluses or minuses? Um, well, I mean, I just, it, it was difficult Tuesday. Um, I had decided I was going to watch Cardiff, um, Brighton also, uh, anyway. Um, but I, I, pre-game, obviously, there's a lot of commercials. So I'm on NBC, um, Ahmed Farid, uh, Kyle Martino, Rob Earl doing a good job as usual. Uh, I switched to TNT, and it, it, quite frankly, it just, uh, at the commercials on NBC, it, it was just you know, a much lower level, the, the level of presentation, the level, level of commentary, the, the production for my personal preferences. Again, their personal preferences. I think there are a lot of people maybe younger than me that like TNT's um, presentation style better than they like NBC's. But, um, yeah, I, I just, you know, then switched back to NBC and stayed on NBC. And then post game tried to do the same thing. Same thing happened to me back to NBC. So, uh I, I, I think they were okay on Wednesday, but Wednesday I wasn't paying too much attention, to be honest with you. Uh, in the times I did, I thought it was uh, it was uh, really quite um, pedestrian. I mean, I, I, again, we compared them to Fox, so we've compared them favorably on this show. But I have not made the head-to-head comparison with NBC. There had been no occasion to do so, quite honestly. And it was uh, it was difficult. I mean, it's just very different than how NBC presents – uh, these things, and I guess, Chris, I'm just maybe it's personal, personal preferences. I'm just more, much more comfortable with NBC's presentation stock. Yeah, me too. I mean, I mean, there's definitely some hits, uh, hits and misses with uh, the Champions League coverage on TNT this week. Uh, they had a uh, a segment about uh, a student from Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School uh, in South Florida, uh, you know, a, a promising young soccer player. And uh, uh, Borges, who went on and, and actually, um, in terms of the tragedy that happened, w- was a hero. Um, and the story of what happened, which was really difficult to watch. Um, it wasn't, I mean, and, and then obviously there's a soccer thread going through this. Uh, it was pretty, pow- it was a very powerful segment. And then afterwards, having uh, having Kate Abdo and Moa Doon and, and um, Steve Nash and Stuart Holden discussing it and uh, discussing the Barcelona, what they what they had did uh, to help out this uh, you mean, promising young soccer star. That was that was good. It was it was difficult to watch, but um, was a good piece. It, but then some of the other stuff they did was just kind of really cheesy. They had uh, this one segment where they p- pretended to have a movie trailer about uh, Ole Gunnar Sons- Oscar. It was called Old Dog New Tricks. And that was really, really cheesy. Um, then they have this, um, which they did last week, and they had this week too. They have this segment with the BR football guys. And um, I think last week I posted it on Twitter and saying, okay, wouldn't it be nice to have um, some Americans who are knowledgeable about, about soccer discussing the Champions League? Uh, you mean, it, it is, after all, an American channel on TNT. I mean, at the end of the day, you want to go to pull in whoever the, the best experts are. I mean, no matter what language or where they come from, but BR Football, I think the, the social media team, I think, is based in London, and it was just three, I mean, teenagers to, I mean, twenty somethings talking about the Champions League, and it just, it's, yeah, I it's just really that. hokey, just really not. I don't know, it just does not fit at all. I'm the sure place. on social media it's fine, but on television it, it doesn't work at all. 
Yeah, the points those guys made weren't bad at all. I mean, in fact, it's it, in terms of football radio or soccer radio might be uh, better than other things that, that are available. But um, it just didn't fit, right, in, in, in the context of the pregame show, unless you're going to bring those guys in the studio and make them analysts. Right, right? exactly. Uh, I, I just – it was weird. And uh, But there was some good tactical breakdowns. Again, Stu Holden doing a good job. Uh, Moadu to – uh, at the wooden table that they had in place on Tuesday, kind of, uh, and looking at, I think, Liverpool and Porto and, I mean, Barcelona, uh, actually it was Barcelona, uh, Man United, how the team would line up, but also how the team would push up, up the yeah, the wings and, and how that would, uh, I mean, change the shape of the team and how they would have to cover. That was interesting. It, it, but uh, overall, it's been a mixed bag, really, from BR Football and TNT. No, it's yeah, pa- and it's it's difficult, Chris, because I know um, UEFA does not like and and, and uh, you know, they have prohibitions against domestic leagues playing um, alongside the right. Champions League, Europa League, and this this Cardiff uh, uh, Bright, Brighton Cardiff match was rescheduled because of uh, Brighton's deep run in the FA Cup, so that gave NBC an opportunity to showcase a Premier League broadcaster, you know. Uh, kind of uh, outdoing a, a UEFA uh, a license for a UEFA uh, media rights holder. So uh, I, maybe this is part of it. I mean, I know they don't want to take attention away from UEFA competitions, but it's also perhaps the television spectacle of domestic leagues, particularly relegation fights in, in, in domestic leagues, uh, adding that to the, the, the television coverage, the spirit of television coverage, is a difficult thing for the Champions League to overcome. I, you know, I, I, I made the decision I was going to watch Brighton Cardiff, Chris, but that did not mean I wasn't open to flipping the channel, go, you know, trying to seek out Champions League, watch uh, two, three matches at once. I just was into the Cardiff Brighton game for all the reasons we talk about about promotion, and relegation, and and spectacle, and uh, superior television coverage. There was no there was no incentive for me to watch Champions League with a Premier League ma- match me- that meant so much on at the same time, and that that's mm-hmm. unfortunate. That's a neutral football perspective. Now there are people who say, oh, you should watch the best football ever on uh, television. These are the same people who don't watch domestic football here in the U.S. and, and, and look thumb their nose at it. And most of them are Manchester United or Barcelona fans. I get it. And I got a lot of backlash for saying, hey, I'm watching Carter, not Manchester United. But um, there were reasons for it. And I think maybe that explains why UEFA has this prohibition. Well, um, in, in the past, it's interesting, too, because in the past, um, UEFA has fined the Premier League for having games on at the same time as Champions League uh, usually at this stage in the season because, I mean, there's fixture pile up. Uh, the Premier League's trying to fit uh, the fixtures in as much as possible to before the end, end of the season. I think the difference with this one was I'm pretty sure that the Brighton-Cardiff game wasn't televised uh, <clears throat> in, in the UK. So, <clears throat> so, so they could get away with that. And actually, uh, you know, the rest of the world, I mean, yes, we can watch that game if we wanted to. But um, that's probably the difference there. But it, it is interesting that, yeah, usually there's kind of a... Um, you mean UEFA comes in and says, "Okay, no televised games at the same time as the Champions League; otherwise, you will be fined." Now, speaking of NBC's coverage, Kartik, and, and from this past weekend with the Premier League, I, I just really thought that they have taken it to a whole new level. Now, it, it's almost like the, the best has gotten better, and this past weekend especially was just a really, really well done weekend. Um, I know you missed, and, and you're not a fan of the Fan Fest, but a few weeks ago, that really kind of kind of built up the hype a lot for this uh, end, end of the season with the title race and, and the relegation battle going on. And a couple of weeks ago, we talked about NBCSN and my concerns, and I, and I think your concerns too, Kartik, about Sky Sports and the integration with NBC because Comcast, who owns uh, NBC, uh, went ahead and bought Sky Sports uh, late last year. And in the last month or two, we've seen some uh, little bits and pieces of kind of Sky Sports being uh, integrated into the coverage of the Premier League, uh, in addition to which is the, which was the big concern, Sky Sports News. You mean daily or well, weekdays? You mean uh, for an hour on NBCSN? And to me, at the end of the day, there's two types of Sky Sports: Sky Sports News, which is very sensationalized, very suspenseful, very you mean you know, breaking news according to Sky sources, which 
99 times out of 100, those are not Sky sources. Those are sources from their competitors, whether it's the Well, in, in fact, yesterday they broke Sky Sources report that Bolton's going to be sold on the 11 o'clock one on, uh, on NBCSN. When I had already had the report from the Telegraph, they had broken right. the story themselves. Yeah. Uh, so, hours earlier. So according to Sky Sports, uh, Sources, which is the Telegraph, so rather than saying, <laughs> according to the Telegraph, which is so, uh, it, it, it's horrible. I mean, it's, yeah, it's horrible. So, but then on the other side, you have Sky Sports Television, the actual channel that broadcasts the games, I mean, most of the Premier League games, uh, and, and, and other games too. And, and, and I think my concern was with the Sky Sports News that that would kind of filter into NBC's uh, coverage and would dumb it down a little bit. But what we got this past weekend, Friday, was a pleasant uh, outing, I thought. It was a really, I mean, NBCSN said, OK, let's go ahead. Friday Night Football, uh, the Leicester game against Newcastle, let's just go ahead and show the entire Friday Night Football feed directly from Sky Sports from start to finish, even pre-game, half-time, post-match. And it was the first opportunity we've ever had in this country to experience what a British broadcast of a Premier League game is like from start to finish. And yes, there's some things that are not perfect. I mean, even post-match, Sky was talking about a lot of the coverage coming up and I don't know, they got darts and they got rugby, rugby league and these other things, which none of which are, are going to be available on NBCSN. Um, it was a promo essentially for Sky Sports. That didn't work. That's kind of a little bit clunky. But overall, Kartik, I'm, I'm not sure if you had a chance to watch the coverage of it, but it was so well done. Really, really, really top stuff. Yeah, well, first off, I, I didn't get to watch it because ironically enough, I was doing a Facebook Live session, which I recommend our listeners watch. Uh, with Paul Daglish, whose sister, Kelly Cates, was actually hosting uh, Sky Sports. Irony, small world, right? Uh, so I uh, did about an hour with, with Daglish during the uh, uh, Leicester Newcastle game. Not about that. We didn't talk about uh, England at all. It was all about U.S. soccer and, and, and Miami FC, which he coaches, and, and, and I'm their play by play voice. Uh, but uh, we got into a lot of topics about just general kind of player development topics in the U.S. Um, I would say, though, in the 2009-2010 season, Chris, you might remember this, ESPN gave us that sort of wraparound coverage from ESPN UK. We would get Ray Stubbs That's right. and Kevin Keegan, Rebecca uh, Lowe. Game, John Champion, uh, and whoever his partner was. Rebecca Lowe was actually on those uh, yep. uh, Side, telecasts. Like sideline reporter. Side line, yeah, the yep. third, uh, th- third, third uh, 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 person on the third commentator. So... Um, we got that, but ESPN was new at it, and it was this is the first time we've gotten kind of the Sky Sports uh, wraparound. So that's uh, that, that, that's interesting. I do think um, when it comes to Sky, after and I know this was Kate's character and um, Neville. I think once you get past those three, there's a significant drop off in their uh, talent on air, yep. uh, which you don't uh, get that sort of drop off if you watch. BBC's coverage, Match of the Day, and other programs that the BBC does, bumper programs. Alan Shearer is very good. And then you get really good points from people like Jermaine Genius when they come in studio. Uh, even Danny Higginbotham, you just mentioned him earlier. I mean, he comes in and he, he's fantastic. He's fantastic in everything he does. But um, So I think Sky was very good for that Friday night football, and they're good with Monday night football. But over the weekend, there's some drop-offs from what I understand. The commentator level, the presentation level isn't necessarily as high. Yeah, absolutely. Some some of the things I was impressed by were um, for this Leicester Newcastle game pre match is the access that Sky Sports had to the pitch. So we've seen this from NBCSN when they go ahead and, and kind of make the, uh, the one of those Premier League weekends and, and they travel to the UK and and have the pitch side desk. This was even even more of a pitch side desk. I mean, they were able to walk around kind of um, the um, the bench area onto the pitch. Uh, that was really good and probably. This this was just luck, really, but well, luck, but in, in a bad way, unfortunately, on, on bad news. But about 45 minutes before this game kicked off, um, the news broke that uh, Tommy Smith, one of uh, Liverpool's um, all time great captains, yeah. uh, someone who had won many European medals and FA Cup medals, etc., with Liverpool, had passed away. And this is something, too, that um, the timing of this and, and Jamie Carragher, obviously being a former Liverpool uh, player, Kelly Cates, you mean, being uh, the daughter of a, uh, a legend at Liverpool, they were able to start off the broadcast by, you mean, not, not breaking the news, but talking about the news, talking about their memories of Tommy Smith. And um, 
this is something that perhaps NBCSN could have done, but not as well as because of the Liverpool connection that Sky Sports has. So that was an advantage on some bad news, but an advantage of, of actually going to uh, Sky Sports and having them do that. The other thing that I was impressed by with Sky is just really smooth graphics. Uh, pre-match, there was a sit-down interview with Brendan Rodgers. Um, lots of analysis pre-match, lots of discussion. A lot of the things that we like about NBC SN's coverage and why we think that is so well done uh, re were reflected on Sky Sports' coverage uh, too. So there's a lot of similarities on that level. Now, for a lot of listeners, you're probably wondering, okay, well, does this mean now we're going to get Friday Night Football and Sky Sports live, live feeds uh, throughout the season? I don't think so. I think this is kind of a one-off thing. Uh, you had the NHL games on, on Friday, uh, probably a lot of the talent traveling. But this is just a – there's not that many Friday night football games anyway. There's only one more between now and the end of the season. But this is probably an easy way to go ahead and, and really test it, see how it works. Um, probably there wasn't as much talent available in Friday in the studio. So let's go ahead and, and run with the Sky Sports news uh, – Sky Sports broadcast. Maybe they'll do, do it on Mondays perhaps in the future. Um, we'll have to wait and see, but uh, overall, I was really impressed. And, and other than kind of just the promos for Sky Sports programming at the very, very end, I had no complaints. I really enjoyed this one. Now, Kartik, um, Sunday's broadcast of uh, the Premier League, I'm not sure if you caught this one too, but um, this was on Premier League morning with Rebecca Lowe on Sunday morning. This is before the Palace Man City game, and uh, NBC had a tribute to the 30th anniversary of the Hillsborough disaster. Yeah. And it was probably about a 10-minute segment, um, maybe, maybe even a little bit longer. But honestly, I, I was watching this, and uh, I was in tears. I mean, Rebecca Lowe did a, just a really, really good job of discussing what had happened for those listeners and, and more viewers had, that uh, don't know the story, uh, went through it, brought everyone up to date in terms of everything that's been going on in the recent, um, recent months, actually, a lot of uh, developments been happening, and I thought it, this was a really perfect example of NBCSN doing their homework, uh, paying tribute, and really doing just a really tastefully fantastic piece that that really showed why Rebecca Lowe is, is is to me the number one sports presenter on all of U.S. television. I I have not seen anyone that's as good as her, and I, I thought this was just a perfect example of, of how good NBCSN is. Now, Kartik, uh, we had another surprise this past weekend as far as Premier League coverage, and that was the Palace Man City commentator. Uh, did you get a chance to experience this one? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, I, I was quite frankly fr focused on the Masters. I don't watch many other sports other than soccer. I quite frankly don't watch much sports, period. <laughs> uh, just soccer. But um, I was watching the Masters. I do watch the major golf events. So um, the, 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 tea, the tea times have been moved up because of uh, the storm that was uh, uh, expected and did arrive in Augusta um, during the normal time when the uh, final round of the Masters would be played. So I didn't get to watch it completely. But Clyde Tilsley being on the broadcast was um, pretty amazing, quite a surprise, uh, quite frankly, something I never expected. Um, he generally doesn't call um, live Premier League matches. He's known for his call of the uh, Champions League and known for his call of, uh, of uh, a FIFA video game, former call of the FIFA video game. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, that was that was quite a shock, and it was fantastic. I mean, the, the bits I saw. Um, in fact, I was motivated to switch back during every commercial because of, of his commentary. And uh, look, I, I mean, it's personal preference again. We talked about personal preferences earlier in why I preferred watching uh, uh, the, the the NBC show uh, with, with Kyle and and and, and Robbie and, and Ahmed Farid over the uh, TNT one. Uh, I uh, prefer his style of commentary to that of Arlo White. Um, their contrast couldn't be more vivid with White calling uh, the uh, Liverpool match afterwards, Liverpool-Chelsea. Uh, but I, I, there are perfectly good arguments for white people and, and preferences, again, why they would prefer all the white. But very different commentary style. Maybe uh, for those who have their personal preferences, which are different, maybe tough to get used to during that match. But um, I enjoyed it. This was a huge coup for NBCSN. I mean, on Friday, every Friday on uh, worldsoccertalk.com, we always publish the list of commentators uh, for the, the weekend games. 
And um, this past Friday, we had got you know, Palace against Man City, Clive Tilsley and Stephen Warnock as far as the co-commentator. And I thought nothing else of it other than, okay, that's great. Clive is doing that, that game for the world feed. I just assumed it was the world feed. And then Sunday morning, we find out that Clive Tilsley and Stephen Warnock, there's a live uh, shot of them talking to Rebecca and holding up uh, NBC SN mics. And I'm like, holy cow, this is such a huge coup for NBC SN. Now, whether or not they'll continue to use uh, Clive Tilsley for other games, I hope so, because he's really really one of the quintessential English commentators. And for a lot of listeners in the United States and viewers in the United States, they're probably not as familiar with him as they would be, say, Martin Tyler. Reason being, and I was astounded by this, Kartik, this game, this Palace Man City game, was uh, Clive Tilsley's first ever live Premier League match he commentated on. And like you said, Kartik, he's he's known for doing the Champions League in England, doing the finals, Mm -hmm. every final since 1998. I, uh, that's quite a bit of knowledge, Chris. Sorry to cut you off. I, uh, I, I, like I said, I associate him with the Champions League and with uh, the FIFA video game. I did not know he had never commentated a live Premier League match before. That's, yeah. boy, that's something. Which, which to me, it's a coup because if NBCSN says, you know what, Clive, um, the feedback we've gotten from this first game uh, was, was positive, we'd like to con- continue to hire you on a... Uh, as needed basis, and uh, yes, I mean midweek you're doing Champions League, but on those weekends that you're available, let us know. We'd love to fit you in. Uh, if that can happen, that is a huge cue for NBC SN because you're hiring a world class commentator who, obviously, for whatever reason, probably because he works for ITV doing the Champions League, probably doesn't do a lot of the Premier League coverage. But but then again, Peter Drury works for ITV. John Champions worked for ITV in the past. Um, and they've done commentaries for um, for the Premier League. So, uh, so that part I'm not sure about. But if Clive is on a on a long term contract or a short term contract, I, I just thought he did a great job. And it, and to me, there's a way to go ahead and still have Arlo. I mean, it's definitely fans of Arlo. And like I said last week too, Arlo did it is is improving in different ways. Is a good commentator. It's just not my favorite. But if they can f- figure out ways to have Clive Tilsley there, uh, Stephen Warnock did a really good job too in the co commentary. This, to me, was just um, from this past weekend. This is one of the best Premier League weekends I've seen on NBCSN in a long time for, for the, the reasons we've, we've just talked about. And uh, one more, really impressed. One more point about Clive Tilsley. I, I think he's also associated with calling a lot of uh, – because I'm not sure if American uh, listeners are familiar about how the rights are divided up in the U.K., uh, within the UK market for England national team games in major and major tournaments, but he's ended up calling a fair number of England matches in the Euros and in the World Cups. So he's also very closely associated with the England brand, uh, uh, Team England, if you will. But uh, but again, uh, that's a shock to me that he had never uh, Clive Tilsley had never called a pre- live Premier League match until this weekend. Wow, and it was on American television. That makes this yep. really good, I think. Yeah, one more thing real fast, too, is that uh, this is from one of our listeners, uh, who is also a commentator, Chris Whittingham. Uh, he mentioned, too, how impressed he was with Bill Leslie, who did the commentary on Friday's game, the, the Leicester-Newcastle game. And Bill is somebody that we don't get to hear that much either, uh, because he does a lot of the work for, um, for Sky Sports, but uh, did a really fantastic job. Now, from this past weekend, Kartik, to me, uh, my game of the week was um, Sevilla against Real Betis. Uh, the derby there, a 3-2 win for Sevilla. Uh, how about you? What was your uh, favorite game of the weekend? Uh, uh, that's a good question. I would have to say uh, it was probably... Um, I, I, this, this, again, may sound... Uh, Sound ridiculous, but it was probably that 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 Burnley Cardiff match because there was a lot on the line. Or no, actually, let me correct it. I'm going to say it was a Sheffield United Millwall match uh, because uh, Millwall needed a point, Sheffield United needed three points, and uh, Sheffield United controlled the match. But I think Millwall's strategy was to just um, uh, get it down to like a 15 minute period. They're down one nil, uh, but they still continued to play very defensively down one nil. And they, they, they had a smash and grab equalizer. So it would probably be that. Yeah. And I mentioned uh, Real Betis a second ago, too. They will be heading to the States this summer on a tour uh, just this week to Aston Villa. 
speaking of the championship, Kartik, uh, have announced that they're going to be playing a friendly against Minnesota United. On top of that, you've got Chelsea coming, you've got Arsenal coming, Manchester United. Um, Liverpool is supposed to be announcing a tour any day now. Of course, you've got Real Madrid against uh, Atleti playing in, I think it's in New York. Uh, some big games come in this, this summer. And speaking of the friendlies coming to the U.S. this summer, if you ever need tickets for that or anything else, make sure to check out our sponsor, SeatGeek. For a long time, buying tickets has been really difficult and annoying with a few big companies who don't care uh, about the customer. SeatGeek pulls in millions of tickets from all over the web, rates each deal on a scale of 1 to 10, and displays them on an interactive seat map. So it's simple to find what you're looking for. Green dots are good deals and red dots are overpriced. Plus, every purchase is fully guaranteed, so you can shop for tickets with confidence. I have the SeatGeek app on my phone, and it's definitely easy to use. And I've used it this week to look for tickets uh, for the Aston Villa game against Minnesota United, as well as uh, the game, the Tampa Bay Rowdies game I went to against Louisville, in addition to looking at some of the dates for the Madrid derby uh, up north and, and many other games coming to uh, the United States this summer. Best of all, my listeners get $10 off their first SeatGeek purchase. And lastly, of course, SeatGeek supports our show. So go support them because they support us. Use our promo code WSTPOD, that's one word, for $10 off on your first purchase. You can use that for concert tickets, sports, comedy, whatever you want. Remember, that's promo code WSTPOD for $10 off your first purchase. Now, Kartik, moving on to TV streaming news. And uh, this one broke, I think, on Friday last week after the show recorded. But uh, let's go ahead and talk about it because it's, uh, it's interesting news. Yeah, so Fox uh, has made their uh, uh, coverage plans for the Gold Cup known and their commentary teams known. And, and uh, it created quite a reaction that Landon Donovan and Bruce Marina will be joining uh, the Fox team Uh John Strong will be the, the lead commentator, Stu Holden, the lead co-commentator. We, we kind of knew that, right, already? Yeah. Uh, because they weren't part of the Women's World Cup plans. Uh, so we assumed they were doing uh, Gold Cup. And the other studio analysts will include Moadu, Fernando Fiore, that's predictable also, and Kobe Jones, that's actually somewhat predictable as well. Because, of course, they do everything out of Los Angeles. So they get L.A.-based talent, which is part of Arena and, uh, and Donovan, part of that. But... Uh, there was some uh, very bad reaction to this on, on social media, to say the least, and, and I think particularly about Donovan uh, more so than Arena. It's um, I, for whatever reason, Landon Donovan has taken on the, a um, a villain role since uh, uh, the the Mexico debacle over the summer last summer, and. Uh, there just seems to be a, 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 a large uh, contingent of American fandom that uh, doesn't want to see or hear from the guy. Which is interesting, too, because uh, Alexi Lalas did the same thing as Landon Donovan. I mean, they both, uh, you mean, through some, got some, uh, you mean, some sponsorship deals or advertising deals, uh, promoting the Mexican national team, pr- promoting El Tri. I mean, Alexi Lalas did it, was in some, com- some commercials, I believe, too. Landon Donovan did the same exact thing, but I'm not hearing much of a uh, reaction to Alexi Lalas. I, I, I guess because it's the Gold Cup, right? Because it's the Gold Cup and Mexico's involved versus the Women's World Cup, where I don't think that Mexico qualified for that tournament. Maybe that's it. Maybe that's the reason. Um, go, that's a really but, good point, Chris. I hadn't thought about that because this was all about, I mean, on Friday on social media, I saw people, you know, with screenshots of him putting the Mexico, you know, that, that, that famous yeah. image of him. Uh, and it was just, uh, there was a lot of backlash against Arena also because Arena has a bad television presence and uh, we've, we, we've heard from him you know, in, 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 in fix since uh, the U.S. didn't qualify. Although I would point out to those who have criticized the Arena uh, uh, appointment, if you read Bruce Arena's book, which I've done now, it's very different than what you might perceive of him. He makes a lot of the same critiques that those of us who tend to be reformers. He hasn't embraced promotion education, don't get me wrong, but a lot of the critiques about youth development and tactics and, and, and MLS – that we make as well. I, I, I don't know. Maybe he was trying to sell books, so he wanted to be controversial. But he certainly has a, a, a streak of reformer in him, which he always did. He, yeah. He, I mean, I, I have to say, he's been, those he's been a nonconformist. Yeah. I, I, I want to just put point this out. This is not media related, although I guess it is because we're talking about him because he's going to be on the Gold Cup coverage. Those of you who think that Bruce Arena is some sort of establishment status quo figure do not know the early days of MLS. And quite frankly, MLS would look like a much more bastardized. 
uh, league uh, than it does currently. Uh, it, it, and you might think it does. It, it, we, they might have different rules that don't conform with international football, if uh, not for the intervention of three people, which were Bruce Arena, Kevin Payne, and uh, Thomas Rongen. And Bruce Arena had the loudest voice in that room, and he stopped a lot of stuff from happening mm-hmm. because he was involved in the international game. And he felt the U.S. need to play on the same, uh, by the same rules in the same type of arena that 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 everyone else did. So um, yeah. he's never been a terribly conformist. Now back to Donovan, Chris. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I'm I torn on it because I, uh, I I think that he has a lot to offer. He was quite good during the Copa America, if you remember, in 2016. But then yeah. well, that Mex- There's Mexico a big difference, thing- though. There's a big difference with this one, which is why I'm not happy with this decision, is that, is that Landon Donovan did great in the Copa America as a co-commentator, not as an analyst. I mean, he, he had teamed up with JP. It was... Because all the talk was, I, mean, I think we had an article about it, either you wrote it or I wrote it, about how well JP and Landon Donovan worked together. And it was like, oh my gosh, this is a perfect duo. And Donovan, too, had been, had been announced, uh, it was featured in advertising that he'd be doing the World Cup for Fox. There's, there's photographs of uh, the whole team together with Landon Donovan as part of the team. Then he pulled out, I think because he was playing, well, playing soccer, I think I think I think he decided to, to play to play professionally again, so then he dropped out. But but to me, Bruce Arena now as a coach and as someone looking at his written words, I would say okay, I, I have respect for him, and it, he's somebody too. With his um, second stint with the LA Galaxy, was pretty critical of Major League Soccer. Would call him out on whether it's refereeing decisions or, or scheduling decisions or playing on turf and those types turf. of things. <laughs> yeah, but as a Analyst, he is the most boring analyst I can imagine. He's he's the most boring analyst analyst I've ever had to watch on television. Now Donovan, I think as an analyst would be okay, but to me, why not put him in the co-commentary spot? I mean, yes, you have JP and Stuart Holden, but well, actually John Strong and Stuart Holden. But yeah, JP is going to be in France for the Women's World Cup, but it's got to be somebody else that you could team up with him. Mark Followill, maybe perhaps, or somebody you can say, okay, all right. Let's go ahead and have Landon Donovan be on the co-com because that's really, to me, his forte. It's, it's not the analyst, uh, the, the analysis in the studio. All right, let's move on, Kartik. A couple more pieces of news. Uh, ESPN Plus, this is big news. So last week, uh, we've been talking a lot about Disney Plus coming up, which is it's going to be announced and released later this year. But uh, in this announcement that ESPN Plus, uh, it Disney Plus had last week, they re- revealed some information about ESP- ESPN Plus, and uh, thanks to one of, our, one of our listeners for letting us, l- giving us the tip about this one. So ESPN Plus is projected to hit between 8 and 12 million subscribers by 2024. They're currently over 2 million subscribers today. Uh, operating losses of about $650 million in fiscal 2019 and fiscal 2020, and they're expected to be profitable by 2023. Uh, Disney Plus will be available starting November 12th for six ninety nine a month. And there's supposed to be a bundle. There's supposed to be, if you're an ESPN Plus subscriber, uh, you will have an opportunity to get DS, uh, Disney Plus to add that on as a bundle. That hasn't been officially announced yet, but from what I understand, that will happen. But both ESPN Plus and Disney Plus, what they're doing is smart because what they're doing is uh, gobbling up new subscribers at a really rapid rate with a really low price point. You mean six ninety nine for Disney Plus and four ninety nine for ESPN Plus, uh, taking a loss, taking loss of you mean, you mean hundreds of millions of dollars uh, through till about twenty twenty three, and then by twenty twenty three or twenty twenty four, at that point, then it would be profitable for them, and they'll probably increase the price at that point uh, just a little bit uh, uh, now that they would have had had you hooked for a few years. Now, I, I, I have heard an interesting piece of analysis, Chris, this week, uh, privately, but I'm going to share it publicly. I have permission to share it publicly, which is um, an analyst and I talking, basically saying part of the reason ESPN, that Disney is able to do this and fund these losses, uh, much the same way Amazon has funded losses throughout their history, right, and has been cash positive while losing money, um, is because of the numerous staff layoffs. Uh, that they had the previous two years. I had never put two and two together. I, I, and I don't know if that's true, but that was an analyst speaking to me, and I thought, oh, that, that's really interesting. That's at least an interesting discussion point, whether it's true or not. Um, it's an interesting starting point. But uh, if that's the case, maybe ESPN, and you hate it when, when people and colleagues and people you really respect lose their jobs, 
Uh, but by trimming payroll, they're able to offer this really good OTT product uh, at um, in, in a competitive market at a hyper competitive price. So um, just, you know, I, I think that that's an interesting take on it. And uh, they're going to be losing money, as you just said, for years on this. All right. And speaking of, of OTT, over-the-top services like uh, Disney Plus or, or the ESPN Plus, uh, one more news item before we move on. Yeah, Stats, uh, which I think a, a lot of people know here in the States, uh, has merged with Perform, which is going to allow uh, DAZN uh, to prioritize its OTT service. Um, last year, and we talked about this on the show before, uh, DAZN Group was created as uh, Perform split into two, two different en- entities. Stats is going to provide all kinds of uh, – Technology, data, content um, for uh, for leagues. They do a lot. I think they do think a lot of the college football stuff, a lot of Major League Baseball, etc. Um, and uh, by bringing uh, Perform into the fold, uh, they're going to be able to kind of just create the synergy of, uh, of 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 items that enhance uh, the zone's prospects. And uh, uh, we'll see. I mean, I the, but. Just as we're talking about price point, Chris, with ESPN Plus and Disney Plus, DAZN now, their price point has gone up. So um, this would make their product better. It doesn't necessarily make them more competitive. Yeah, and maybe with DAZN, maybe they go for the annual plan. I mean, if they go ahead and acquire the rights to the Bundesliga, as one example, um, next summer, that's something they can say, hey, well, we'll give you the entire season for, I don't know. $79 $79 a season. You have access to every single game. And, and, and on an annual plan, I mean, that, then it's cost, it's cost effective. Um, but right now, I think it's gone up to, I think, $20 a month. So, um, so maybe that's the way they're heading. And maybe they'll offer some price discounts for soccer fans if they do add on the Bundesliga or other leagues. Now, moving on to TV ratings, Kartik, uh, this past week was illuminating is probably a good word to to uh to say about it um i know that you going into this weekend had a lot of questions about the masters and how much of an impact the the masters golf tournament would have on tv coverage of soccer and how revealing it would be and i mean is it one of those things where the masters kills all soccer uh viewing numbers you mean is it going to be a huge hit or was it not and let's go through some of the numbers, and then we'll get your take on it. So the Man United against West Ham game, this was on Saturday, NBC uh, on NBC over the air, and Univision. I um, know oh, it wasn't Univision. It was Universo, perhaps. Sorry. Uh, this one had 962,000 viewers for this one. On Sunday, which was really kind of the, uh, the big day of the Masters, you had Liverpool against Chelsea on NBC, SN, and Telemundo. Uh, this one averaged 827,000 viewers. Uh, the early kickoff was the Crystal Palace against Man City on NBCSN and U- Universo. Uh, 404,000 uh, viewers for that one. Then you had uh, the MLS games from this past weekend. So you had a big game on Saturday, which was the opening of the new Minnesota United Stadium. Uh, this was on ESPN2 in, um, in prime time from 5 to 7 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, this one had uh, against NYCFC. 119,000 viewers for this one. And then on Sunday, you had uh, the big game too, which was uh, Sporting Kansas City against New York Red Bulls on FS1. And this is again on, in prime time from 7 to 9 p.m. Eastern. This one, 90,000, 90. This is, uh, I, I'm pretty sure, the lowest uh, viewing number for FS1 uh, MLS coverage uh, so far this season. So based on those numbers, Kartik, and, and you watching the, mas- the Masters, I wasn't watching it, so I had no idea in terms of uh, which times were the times where the Masters were kind of into the final round, etc. What does this tell you about the viewing habits of, of soccer fans in the United States? Okay, so the, the, the two matches that would have been directly affected by the Masters, actually three matches, would have been uh, the, the Saturday uh, 5 to 7 p.m. Minnesota NYCFC, um, the uh, Sunday morning Palace Man City and the Sunday morning Liverpool Chelsea. Uh, it seems like, and this is surprising because again, the, the overkill of the Masters as as a, as a spectacle oftentimes comes from UK media, right? Sky Sports talking about it endlessly. It's the last day. Uh, the Masters is the last event that's on terrestrial uh, or free to air television in the UK. Everything else has gone. Uh, 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 to, to satellite. Uh, so BBC has the final two rounds of the Masters. That's the remaining golf coverage. ITV has no remaining golf coverage. 
Uh, so um, that's um, that, 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 that you would think would affect uh, anglicized fans. But then again, we're talking about American fans of the Premier League. Didn't seem to have an effect, right, on uh, on either uh, Premier League match. Uh, four or four K is pretty much what you'd expect on a Sunday morning. Maybe even a little higher yeah. on an early Sunday kickoff. Yeah, and then obviously higher than uh, you'd expect for Liverpool, Chelsea, and Minnesota NYCFC one nineteen K. I think it had to have been affected. That was the third round of the Masters. Uh, Tiger Woods was on the course, though, and that that's the important thing. It's not just the Masters; it's Tiger Woods. Tiger Woods was on the course during that match. Tiger Woods was on the course during the two Premier League matches I mentioned. So uh, pretty encouraging numbers for the Premier League. Their fan base is their fan base. Their fan base isn't going to get peeled off by um, – because, look, I know there are a lot of um, people who come back at me saying, well, it's not the NBA or the NHL. Um, the Masters gets higher ratings, actually, t- t- typically, especially when Tiger Woods is in contention. Um, or Phil Mickelson, someone of that that uh, vintage, or Rory McIlroy, a big time player, uh, than N- NBA and NHL playoff games. Now, NBA and NHL finals, uh, well, not even the Stanley Cup finals. They don't, they don't get the same numbers as uh, necessarily some Masters do, but only the NBA finals uh, and, and maybe the conference finals get higher ratings than uh, the Masters and uh, of. of some of the other majors in golf. So it is a pretty big deal. The, the, uh, the rating for CBS was a 7.1, um, and the Premier League held its own against that. So no leakage at all, whereas uh, I don't know what the number was on Saturday. I presume it was lower for the third round. Uh, MLS did not hold its own against that, which um, this, the, the, these are facts, folks. You know, I've been, I've been was predisposed, I'll admit here, and I think, Chris, you kind of sense this. I was predisposed to assume the Premier League number was going to get hit badly mm-hmm. by head-to-head competition with Tiger Woods. It did it. So, uh, and MLS did. And again, that was Tiger Woods in the third round, not in the final round. So, yeah, uh, the, the, tough one. the assumption I would give based on that data then is that for the most part, not, not, not everyone, obviously, but for the most part, Major League Soccer fans or fans of the league or fans watching those games are probably more likely to be fair weather fans where fans of, you mean, the Liverpool Chelsea, which is a huge game, Palace against Man City, huge game. Yeah. Uh, are probably more diehard, more more loyal, more integrated into into that, um, and 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 maybe with Major League Soccer too, it's it's somebody, it's a, it's a more of a, a mainstream audience that is easily pulled away to other big sporting events. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but in terms of looking at the numbers, the number that doesn't make any sense is the Sporting Kansas City New York Red Bulls game on the Sunday night in prime time <laughs> yeah, right. on FS1 with less than a hundred thousand viewers. Um, even the Minnesota game too. I mean, it's it's a brand new stadium. This is a big occasion, but the the similarities between these t- two really poor viewing audiences, Kartik, is these were both away games for teams in the New York area. And you've said this many times before. I think we've talked about it that one of these days for you to write an article about it. Well, we've talked about it on the podcast so many times that maybe we don't have to do that article. But for whatever reason, New York City fans do not tune in in large numbers to watch Major League Soccer. And we've seen this repeatedly, repeatedly for years. This has been a trend that you pointed out probably about two or three years ago. And as time goes on, it becomes more and more... Uh, obvious and the same thing for too for Los Angeles. I mean, same things for major markets, some of the biggest TV markets in the United States, which has been Major League Soccer's big push is to get these teams. The only reason that they've stuck with Miami for so long, uh, have been so patient on this one and, and trying to figure out ways to make it work, is because of the TV market. It's one of um, the most, I mean, sought after TV markets in the United States for, for advertisers because of the Hispanic bilingual audience. And, and Miami is definitely uh, a huge part of that. If you're in the United States and you're, you're I don't know, Pepsi or Budweiser, you want to be advertising into that Miami market. And, and with Major League Soccer, it's, it's a perfect uh, fit there. But time and time again, especially New York, New York, New, York, New Jersey, I, I don't know. I mean, Kartik, the, 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 these are really, really bad numbers. NYC, FC uh, fans, and obviously New York Red Bull fans are not tuning into these games. Yeah, they're horrible numbers. And, and I'll also point out that last season, if I remember correctly, the, the worst nationally televised match, or maybe it was the season before, was between Philadelphia and Chicago. 
Uh, that's the third and fourth largest television market in the country. So uh, MLS is struggling in bigger markets. They do great in uh, in Portland and, and Seattle and Orlando and Salt Lake City. I'm talking about television-wise and Kansas City, although this was a Kansas City game, but they were at home. Uh, they do really well television-wise in getting – uh, a, a, a pretty high market share in those particular markets when their team is playing. So in Salt Lake, you can see on local television as much as a, a, a five or six market share for RSL when they're playing away from home. But in the LA market, um, as much of a great success as LAFC has been, uh, and, and the Galaxy have been the most successful club in the history of the league, uh, you're usually looking at 0.5s, 0.6s, if even that, for their away games. I mean, it's just like uh, the people who watch LAFC and the people who watch, and particularly the people who watch the LA Galaxy uh, away from home, are the 18,000 people going to the games at home. That's it, or 20,000 people, and it's the same thing with Red Bull and uh, uh, NYCFC. Uh, M- MLS has a big television problem in the big markets, and that's um, if, if if you want to understand why. Uh, MLS continues to have some of the struggles it does. It's because they have not built the kind of relevancy they need in those larger markets. Now, the funny thing is always when they push back against ideas like promotion and relegation, uh, calendar change, whatever, it's because, oh, well, we have to protect New York, we have to protect LA, we have to protect Chicago, whatever. But those markets, they're not, they're terribly underperforming in to begin with. So uh, Boston is another one. Um, yep. I don't know. I mean, they'll find excuses, but this is a very, uh, uh, very dangerous situation for them because uh, I, I, I get the sense that this is now becoming more of a trend, Chris, than um, I thought. You know, the first couple of weeks of the season when you were saying what you were saying on MLS ratings, I was pushing back against you and I was pushing back on social media. But now we are uh, six weeks, seven weeks into the season. Now I'm beginning to see this as more of a trend than I did the first few weeks. Um, because the excuse was the first few weeks, oh, we're going up against the NCAA tournament. Then it becomes this. Then it becomes that. Eventually, you realize it's part of a larger problem, um, which may have grown out of, quite honestly, the U.S. not qualifying for the World Cup. Yeah, and, and looking at this past weekend's TV numbers, um, I mean, I mean, you had, like you said, too, the Liverpool-Chelsea game, the Palace-Man City games, those were going right up against the Masters. So um, oftentimes, um, one of the complaints about the Premier League and how they have a lot of advantages on U.S. television is they're not going up against major sports. Well, in this case, they are. And in this case, uh, their numbers were strong. All right, let's move on to listen mail mailbag. Well, well, let me just point out one thing, one more thing, Chris, because co- consistently when I said, well, it's going up against the Masters, I had MLS fans coming back saying, well, that's not the NBA or the NHL. I have to reiterate, the, the, the third and fourth round of the Masters historically have gotten higher ratings than the than early rounds of the NBA playoffs or the NHL Stanley Cup playoffs, especially when Tiger Woods is in contention. So that's not even a contest. That's not even a conversation, really, if you look at historical data. Yeah, yeah. And, and this week, too, just in, in a couple of different places, I was at, I had strangers coming up to me and saying, hey, did you watch the Masters? Did you see that performance by Tiger? Um, and, you know, I, I'm, like, like, unlike you, Kartik, I, I have no interest, zero interest in golf um, to watch it. Not, nothing, not that there's anything wrong with it, but I just do not enjoy watching golf. But just to give you an example, I mean, strangers coming up to me, talking to me about the Masters. That's how, and Tiger especially, that's how uh, big this is. All right, so listen to the mailbag. We do have a bunch to go through. So first up is Harry. He says, how do you balance out the low TV numbers in Major League Soccer? Yet at, yet at the same time, Nipun Chopra, who used to uh, host this podcast, reports that MLS is a growing league attendance-wise. How does MLS get that attendance to cross over to television? So two questions here. First of all, Harry, it's one of those things where people say numbers don't lie. Well, numbers do lie. So wh- when I say numbers don't lie, what I mean, mean by that is the attendance numbers – League-wide by Major League Soccer are reported by Major League Soccer. There's no independent body that comes in and says, okay, let's look at the, uh, the ticket receipts. Let's go through these numbers. And we've seen at games this, se- this season, for many, many seasons, but we've seen pictures of, uh, on empty seats, um, empty seats pick, I think it is, on, on Twitter, uh, where there's maybe 2,000 fans, maybe 3,000 fans, whether it's in New England or Dallas or Houston or other places. And then Major League Soccer reports that there were crowds of ten, over 10,000, 10,000, 11,000, which is simply not true. So 
in many ways, MLS is really fudging those numbers, uh, distributing tickets for free to, you mean, different uh, sports teams, schools, etc. If those people don't turn up, this, they're still counted as people being attending those matches. Yes, there are stadiums in this country that have packed attendances, such as Atlanta, such as Sporting KC, such as LAFC. Um, and Seattle, uh, which those numbers seem to be dipping. But overall, the big teams, or some of the big teams, have some big numbers. But you look at Colorado, you look at Chicago, you look at New England, you look at Columbus, uh, you look at some of these other, other cities that play in Major League Soccer, and they have really poor attendances. But yet the numbers, the spin on this is that it's very positive. Now, how does MLS get that attendance to, to cross over to television? Those are two completely different audiences. I mean, the people that go to the games uh, will watch some soccer on television, but what you need to do is focus on the people that watch soccer on television and figure out a way to make MLS more attractive. And we talked about that in more detail last week, but that's a whole podcast episode just based on that. And we have plenty of ideas. We have plenty of uh, analysis of how they can do that, uh, yet they seem to be very focused on still just attendances, I mean, getting people into the stadiums and, and fudging those numbers, and on expansion. And the expansion fees are coming in at, what, $125 million a team, uh, and that seemed to be, seems to be what they're 100% focused, uh, focused on. Uh, also, I should point out about half the MLS teams had a decline in attendance last year. So these growing attendance spikes are due to expansion teams. So uh, Atlanta, then LAFC, now Cincinnati. Uh, and there are, those clubs are all doing great jobs, of course, and, and, and Minnesota as well, uh, which is a, a newer team. But uh, that came up from NASL. Uh, but the, the, about half, if not the majority of MLS teams are actually seeing attendance drops in recent years. The Soccer Heretic says, uh, on the numerous three-hour round trips this weekend, or this past weekend for my family in the hospital, I've subjected my wife to me catching up on some podcasts when Will Soccer Talk uh, revisited the cost and content of traditional providers versus cord cutting, and it caused my wife to ask how much we save versus content. We both agreed we're as happy uh, or happier after cord cutting with our content. Uh, we did the math on the monthly cost to our household from before and after we got home. We broke down our annual content packages into monthly costs. I need to qualify this uh, this with us having the most expensive internet package available with two access points of differing speed for work and running numerous devices and a phone system for her work. Before cord cutting, we were spending between $500 to $550 a month for traditional services and streaming packages such as Netflix with a ton of filler content we never used on cable and I still wasn't satisfied with my sports, specifically soccer access. After cutting, we're spending what breaks down to $193 a month, and she's just as happy with the content we have access to, whereas I'm elated with the content now. If ESPN Plus were to gain the rights to the Scottish Premier League, I'd be in hog heaven. So the Soccer Heretic, um, definitely want to um, hope that everything is going okay with your family. I, I know that you posted on Twitter a few times that uh, definitely some family health issues, so hopefully everything uh, gets better and goes well there. Uh, Scottish Premier League right now, I think, is with, yeah, definitely is with Bleach Report Live. It's probably going to be there for a while. So um, I don't see ESPN Plus adding those anytime soon, but they do have the Scottish Cup um, on there. So that's uh, something to think about. And um, yeah, thanks for the stats. I mean, that goes to show in terms of cord cutting, how much money you can save. But also at the same time, you're not locked into annual contracts. You're in month to month contracts and you have more freedom. You, mean, you can go ahead and cancel a subscription and take a break for a couple of months and come back. Or you can you mean, go ahead and buy some movies or do whatever you want to do. There's so many opportunities out there and, and choices available. Jazinho says, uh, here are my thoughts on how to grow the game of soccer in the United States. Number one, top MLS clubs participate in the Copa Libertadores every year. Number two, U.S. men's national team participates in the Copa America from here on out. Number three, get rid of Don Garber. Number four, stop scheduling matches when El Clasico is on. And then number five, start taking soccer more seriously instead of treating it like a cartoon, like how Fox Sports treats the World Cup and even Major League Soccer. It can be done, but the psyche has to change. Vincent Dorosco says, I have a question for you guys. I always hear Liga MX has the advantage over the Premier League because their games are in prime time. In your opinion, 
what would be the EPL rating for a match in prime time. My opinion is that the EPL would have a hard time matching Liga MX ratings. Would you guys agree? Love the show. Kartik, uh, what's your take on that? Yeah, I think it would have a hard time catching um, uh, Liga MX. I, I, the one... Uh, uh, the one piece of data we have is not actually from a Premier League match, but is from the El Clasico, which was heavily promoted and, uh, and and pushed by ESPN and got a rating, which is lower. And it was good. I mean, it was over a million viewers yeah, well, uh, that fine. night. But, yeah, but lower than a Club Club America or Chivas match, a good Chivas, a big Chivas match. So uh, I think that would be where you'd be. I think you'd get maybe for Manchester United versus Liverpool, you get numbers like Chivas and Club America get. Uh, for your regular Premier League match, it, it would get a bump, don't get me wrong, but I don't think you would necessarily catch League MX. Rico Richardson says, uh, I don't know why they show the national anthems during a regular season game, MLS game on both Fox and ESPN telecast. It's a waste of time. Should you use that time for more pregame analysis or roundup of scores of other games? Addition by Relegation says, enjoy the podcast as always. ESPN Plus is extremely clunky. I have to dig to find live games as well as replays. I'm hoping ESPN makes it, makes it more user-friendly like Fox Soccer's uh, Match Pass, which has a really good platform but poor content. Ironic that ESPN Plus is the opposite. Anthony Bello says, Hi guys, I uh, was listening to the podcast last week and I would like to take issue with one thing Kartik said and I need clarification on another thing that Kartik said. The issue I have is when he called the Yankees of the late 90s the, the last super team in American sports. I think we are living in an era of the super team in the NFL, the Patriots. In 18 years, they have won six Super Bowls, made nine Super Bowls, won their division 16 times, and have gotten to the conference championship game uh, nine straight years. If that's not a super team by American standards, I don't know what is. Now, Kartik also said that promotion relegation creates super teams. I have been wondering all week, how so? Um, if if uh, Premier uh, 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 Pro Rel uh, creates super teams... Uh, I think it, it, it'll incentivize the ability to buy and really compete. And you're looking at a situation, and I'm sorry about the Patriots admission. I have to admit, I readily don't follow the NFL, but um, that's true. Nine, eight, nine times in 18 years is, is pretty remarkable. Um, my question is, um, do, you, do you get super teams through enforced parity? I think ProRel, an open system where there, you know, there are caps on spending in some ways because of financial fair play, you've developed the Barcelonas, the Real Madrids, the Bayerns, the Juventuses, etc. Uh, you have developed super clubs out of that. Now, uh, do I personally uh, want uh, leagues that are dominated by one team? No, I don't, which is why I sometimes push back on the reformers who – who want a, 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 a completely quasi-fair free market um, uh, model. And I, I like having some caps. I like the German model where you have to have members, you have to have community ownership uh, personally. But there's the evidence in Europe is pretty clear that it has created super clubs. I would argue, actually, Kartik, that uh, you look at Manchester City. I mean, Manchester City, if there was no promotion relegation and they were stuck in, what, the 90s when they were in the third division in England? Right, that, that uh, without pr- promotion and relegation, they might not have gotten back up to the to what was the first division and, the, and then the Premier League. Yeah, League. and they've been, been attempting. Uh, now there was obviously the stadium deal because of the Commonwealth Games in, in Manchester, but also uh, not have been temp- attempting takeover car- target for Sheikh Mansour for sure. Right, right. So promotion and relegation can create super teams uh, for sure. Not not always, but there's an opportunity there for that to happen uh, in in limited cases. But but it definitely, well, yeah. There you go. All right, Raymond Orozco, last one, says, uh, do you think it's possible to start a league from scratch that can be globally competitive in the market as well as have a competitive balance of an American sports league and also generate high profits for the average franchise? This one's a good one. So competitive balance of an American sports league. Um, I have a bone with that one. I mean, you look at Major League Soccer. What, what do you mean by that? Is You mean parity? You mean where kind of all the teams are very much the same and sometimes you mean like a a Colorado can win the MLS Cup one year but then be poor in subsequent years um so that that's debatable but, but even if you remove that and and the initial question from Raymond as far as do you think you start a, a league from scratch that can be globally competitive uh 
Uh, from scratch, I, I don't think so. I mean, unless you're looking at creating a European Super League or a, a global Super League where you have the leagues working together and the, uh, the actual uh, federations working together to say, okay, let's go ahead and create something here based on the experience that we have, based on the the teams and the, the fan bases, and and based on the, the TV revenue, whether it's for uh, or investment into an idea like this, that I can see happening. And which would also generate huge profits for the average franchise in a model like that. All right, you can always reach us through email via. I'll point out one other thing. I think okay. it's very difficult. It's very difficult to have a, 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 a really top league outside the European Union because of the Bosman ruling. This is something again that a lot of critics of MLS don't understand when they say, "Oh, we could have a better league than, than La Liga or the Premier League in the U.S." No, you can't. Uh, and uh, there's there's immigration laws for reasons you can't. Right, right. It's, it's complicated. You can always reach us via email through web at worldsoccertalk.com as well as facebook.com slash worldsoccertalk and on Twitter at worldsoccertalk. Plus, of course, you can always post your comments on worldsoccertalk.com. We'd love to read out your feedback on air. Kartik, before we close up, uh, where can they find you on Twitter if you want to find out about your uh, rants and raves and, and appearances and, and uh, feedback? KKFLA737 on Twitter. All right, and you can find me at uh, the Gaffer for my personal account, or uh, for at World Soccer Talk for the World Soccer Talk account. So thank you for listening. You can get a new episode of the World Soccer Talk podcast every Thursday. Every episode is released on SoundCloud, Spotify, YouTube, Stitcher, iTunes, TuneIn, Audio Boom, and WorldSoccerTalk.com. If you like the show, share it with your friends on social media, and give us a review on iTunes. And Kartik heading into another big weekend of soccer from around the world, including a rematch of uh, Man City against Spurs on Saturday, this time in the Premier League. Uh, we'll have to wait and see if it's, it's, if it's anything as good as the, uh, the Champions League yeah. picture, <laughs> as well as a whole bunch of other matches. Um, what should they do? Enjoy your football.